I neglected to hit record on the video camera yesterday, and so I will preach the same sermon from yesterday for y'all, a congregation of three. There is a way of telling the story of the city of Sodom, a way that this story has been told for centuries now. And the way this story goes is that when Abraham uh, goes his separate ways from his, sep- from his nephew Lot, that Lot goes to the city of Sodom. And while Lot is living there in the city of Sodom, these two visitors come to see him. They're actually angels, though he does not know this. And they're spending the night with Lot as he has offered them hospitality. And in the middle of the night, the, the, the city, the men of the city come and bang on the door, demanding that these two strangers be sent out. Demanding that they be sent out so that these men can rape them. And the fact that it is all men who come to the door indicates that Sodom is a city of only men, men who desire other men. And Lot does not send out these other two men. Instead, he offers to send out his two daughters, his two virgin daughters out. And so the fact that these men are so deranged is shown by the fact they pass up the obviously better offer of two virgin women to rape and instead they insist we must have these two men to have their way with. And then these two strangers uh, cause this crowd of deranged men to be blinded and then they flee the city. Lot and his, his wife and his daughters and the two strangers. I spent an entire afternoon reading about Sodom and the articles and the sermons that are written about this, and and you'll just have to trust me when I tell you that the story, the version of the story that I have just told you is a somewhat restrained version compared to how it is sometimes portrayed. And so this passage, it's weird. It's very weird, and, and so we've been taking this month to look at weird stories, and this definitely counts. And not only is it weird and strange and, some, and told in this fantastic way, it is also a story that has been highly influential in our culture. The name of the town itself, Sodom, is what has led to such terms as sodomy or, or sodomites. It, it is a, a term used in, in biblical translations. If you look at the King James Version, and it's in 1 Kings 14, when it's talking about men of deranged sexuality, in, in the NRSV, a modern translation, that's what it says, male temple, prostu- male temple prostitutes. In the King James, it talks about sodomites. And so the word itself, Sodom, has become this word with a loaded meaning. And so this is a weird story, and it's an important story. And I think it's an important story to read well. And I don't think the way that I've told you the story is actually a very good way to read that story. I think it kind of misses uh, really what's going on. Now, you might say to yourself that it seems bold to suggest that we radically revise, we re-read, we re-understand a story that's been told the same way for so long. And yet, that's actually one of the base assumptions about what it means to read the Bible. The Jewish people believe that every generation that picks up the Bible... It is the task of each generation to pick up the Bible and to reread it for itself, to reinterpret it, to argue about it. And and so to be a Jewish person reading the Bible is to be in an argument about with all the other Jews of the day and all the Jews who have gone before, an, an argument about what is the best way to read Scripture. And as we remember, Jesus also being a Jew, this is what Jesus was talking about, I believe, when he talked about the Spirit that would come to us and guide us into all truth. For there is truth that we do not yet know, and there is truth that we don't yet understand. And so I believe that uh, we are called as followers of Jesus to take up the Bible and to look for ways to read it and read it more faithfully, read it in a way that makes sense to us. And so I'm going to 
what I'm going to argue today is that there is a better way to read this story. And taking into, to remembering some of the lessons we've learned about reading weird passages, that, that you read the, the con, you have to read the context of a passage, to, remembering that there are always multiple ways to read a passage. We're going to read this, this story today, and, and I think it'll, it'll come out a little bit differently. So first, context. To get, the, to get into the context of what's happening here, we've got to back up first. We have to back up and begin with where we first meet Lot. We meet Lot in Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, Abraham has been po- called by God to go to this foreign land. Leave the land you know behind you and go to this foreign land and I will make you the father of many nations. Go, and, and that's what Abraham does. He goes, and Lot goes with him. Lot goes with him. And so from the very beginning, Lot is someone who trusts his family, who is there for his family. He's not the one that God spoke to, but he's the one who trusts Abraham, and they go together, and Abraham and Lot and their family. And so they go, and then in chapter 13, we, read, we hear a little bit more about Lot, that Abraham and Lot, at this point, their, their flocks have grown, grown so great that they have to go their separate ways because the land cannot sustain them. Now, I, I admit I don't know a, a large amount about growing a flock, about uh, livestock, but I am fairly certain that your flock does not grow unless you work and work real hard. And so at this point, what we can see is that Lot is a trusting man, there for his family, and he knows how to work. And so he sounds like a fairly good guy. Sounds like a good guy you'd want to have as a neighbor, a guy you'd like you'd, that you would like to have around. And so we move down in through Scripture a little bit more, and we come to Genesis 18. This is the beginnings of this story. We find Abraham is in his tent, and three guests come to visit him. And these three guests come to visit him, and he rushes out of his tent to greet them, and he he offers them hospitality. Because by offering them hospitality, a stranger becomes a guest, and and it allows them this safe place. And and so he he offers them this hospitality. And, And he offers them this hospitality, and it's extravagant. He says, let me offer you a little bit of bread and some meat, and he goes off and he asks Sarah to make three measures, uh, to use three measures of flour to make the bread. Three measures is about 36 pounds. That's a lot of flour. That's a lot of bread. And and he's going to offer them some meat and some cheese and some, and he goes off and he slaughters a calf for three guests. But this is an extravagant hospitality that he offers. But it is not a hospitality that is unending because he says, let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then be on your way. It's not an unending, open-ended invitation. It's hospitality for a time and then safe travels. Here, take some bread with you. We got leftovers. And so that's what, what, that's what happens. Abraham offers this hospitality they, they have this discussion. We hear about Abraham is going to have a child. Sarah laughs about it. They, they leave on their way. And then we hear the, the, the next part, the la, la, last half of Genesis 18. There's this bit that's kind of confusing. It's about when God and Abraham have a discussion about what's about to happen about the city of Sodom. And God sort of barters with Abraham. How many, they're arguing about how many good people do there have to be before God will spare the city of Sodom. And what Abraham does is he, he barters, he said, well, there's 50 people. And God says, okay, well, for 50. Well, about 45, 40, 35, 30. And, and he bargains his way down until it gets to the point where 10. Abraham says, if there are 10 righteous people in Sodom, will you spare the city, God? And God says, okay. And at this point, If you're thinking about how's Abraham approaching this, he knows that his nephew Lot is there, and that's one righteous person, good man, trustworthy, knows how to work. He's got two daughters, a wife, two son-in-laws. I mean, and then let's say there's one other family that's decent. I mean, that gets you your ten people. And so Abraham's done what he can. He is arguing for the good of the city, arguing because he knows Lot is a good man. He trusts his, his family member. He, he trusts Lot. 
And now we come to Genesis 19, the the passage that we're focusing on today. And, And we come to Genesis 19, and we read about these two men showing up. There were three men, three guests that saw Abraham. There are two that go to Sodom. I don't know where the third person goes. I don't understand that, but but he goes poof. And so now there are two. And these two guests, these two messengers, there are angels, but no one knows it. They show up to the city of Sodom, and, and the very first sentence we read here tells us something amazingly important. They show up to the to the gate of the walled city. And Lot is the one who is guarding the gate. Lot is sitting there in the gate. And and this might seem like somewhat of a throwaway sentence, but it actually tells us a, a lot that we need to know about the city of Sodom. It tells us that Sodom was a walled city. In that day and age, I mean, this is 30 centuries or so ago, in that day and age, if you had a wall, you were invincible. If you had a wall, no one else could touch you. If an army was going to come through and try to conquer the land, if you stood up on your wall, you could just laugh at them. And that was that. Siege warfare had really not been invented. There aren't any siege weapons floating around to use. And and all the soldiers, if they try to starve you out, they're going to starve just as fast as you do. And so if you have a wall around your city, you are golden as long as spies don't get in. As long as spies don't get in. That's, that's the key thing. People have to go in and out of the city, and so you have to make sure that spies don't get into the city. And so whoever guards your gate is essential. Because if spies get in, you're going to fall. That's how, that's how Jericho falls. The very beginning when, when the Hebrew people are going into the promised land, the beginning of the fall of Jericho is the spies who get into the city and then Rahab hides them and then Rahab is saved. So that whole story begins with spies getting into the city. This is, this is how King David takes the city of Jerusalem for he's, the, what is going to be his capital. And the way he, he takes it is he gets people through, through the wall, behind through a waterworks. And so you have to guard the gate. You have to have someone at the gate to make sure that no one gets into the walls. And Lot's the person they trusted. Lot is the person who they trusted to watch the gate. Lot is the person whom they have entrusted with the very safety of all of them. The safety of his family and their family and all their children are entrusted into the hands of Lot. Now, there's probably a rotation. Lot probably takes his week guarding the gate, and then someone else is the next week, whatever. But Lot, at that point, is the person who has been entrusted with the safety of the entire city. And these two guys come out of the distance. And Lot has to figure out what to do because he doesn't know them. He doesn't know them, and this is long before the ages where there are photo IDs, and, and you can't just call over to the, the city cops and ask, can you do a background check? No, this, if you don't know someone then, that, you just don't know them. And there's no way to check. And, and for all Lot knows, they could be exactly what they appear to be. They could be people passing through, or they could be spies. They could be the vanguard of an army that's just over the horizon, waiting to swoop in that night. And so Lot has to handle this situation. And so Lot does. He offers them hospitality. He says, he, Lot says to them, My lords, let me be your humble servants. Let me bring you into my house and wash your feet and prepare for you this great feast. And then on the next morning, early in the morning, you can be on your way. And, and this is the offer he makes. And if you notice, this, this solves the problem, right? He will have them in his house, controlled, and then he's offering hospitality just like his uncle Abraham is. And, and it's hospitality for a, a set period of time. He, he tells them, I will give you this hospitality, then early in the morning you can be back on the road. And it's a rather ingenious solution to the problem. It keeps the strangers in a lockdown situation. A controlled situation. And the strangers, they say, no, that's okay, we'll stay in the city square. Which is exactly what a set of spies would say, because that's where they'd have the freedom to go do whatever they want. And we read that 
Lot insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. And so at this point, Lot has solved the problem. If they're spies, he has them contained. If they're not spies, he has not angered these travelers who are potential traveling business people or whoever. And things are good. He'll have them on the road in the morning. This is great. Until it's not great. Because it gets ugly. People start pounding on the door. And we read that the men of the city, the young and the old... And what, when it says the young and the old, it could be just describing the crowd. It also could be making a reference. When, when we talk about uh, the Congress, it's the House and the Senate. And it could be that this is, this is the city council, and it's made up of the young and the old. And so it could be that it's a sort of a governmental delegation here. We're not certain on that. But either way, the representatives of the city are here pounding on the door, and they want... They want Lot to come to the door and bring out these two strangers because they want to know who they are. They want to know them. Now that verb, know, it can be used in Hebrew euphemistically to talk about sex. And if you're reading this as a passage about sex starved and in deranged males, and that w might be how you read this. But I think it makes more sense to say that when it says to know, that's what it means. We want to know who they are. And, and Lot refuses, which would make sense, because if you suspect someone's a spy, and, and, and how's that going to go? If Lot sends them out, they'll say, we think you're spies. The strangers will say, we're not spies. And then what happens next? In all likelihood, at this point, questioning becomes interrogation, becomes torture. And so Lot is trying to defend the safety of his guests, because he does have the situation under control, and the city council or this delegation of, of the city is pounding on the door, demanding he send them out so that they can be interrogated and potentially tortured. And so Lot says no. And he makes an offer. He makes an offer and he says to them, let me instead send out to you my two daughters. My two virgin daughters who are betrothed to be wed to the men of the city. Right? Again, it, it, it becomes hard to argue that this is a, man, a city of ma only males when we have the two daughters here and, and that they don't value marriage because the, these two daughters are going to be married to the men of the city. And so what we see here is Lot offering up the two daughters. And why is he offering them? Well, he's offering them because they can be proof that he is telling the truth. If, if I give you, if I say to you, I need $15,000 because I need to go buy a car, and you have any doubt about whether I could pay you back, or whether I will pay you back, what you ask for is collateral, right? You ask for collateral. And the collateral in that situation would be the car. And we see this logic happening in Scripture when Joseph, you know, the 12 brothers, Jacob, Jacob has 12 brothers, and the, Joseph, one of those brothers, is sent off to, and is, becomes a slave in Egypt and then works his way up, and he is in charge of all the food of Egypt, and, and, and years later, ten of the remaining brothers come to Egypt and they beg Joseph for food. And, and, and they tell Joseph the story. And, <coughs> and, they, and Joseph says, bring back the, the brother you left behind, Benjamin. And, and, Joseph, and they say, of course we will. And, and Joseph says, leave me some collateral. Leave me someone so that I know you really are going to follow through. And so they leave Simeon behind. It's to, to show that they are going to come back with the youngest brother. And it's that type of logic that's happening here. What Lot is saying to the crowd is, trust me, I've got it under control, and if you don't trust me, take my daughters. That's how much I trust that I've got this, right? Take my daughters as a form of human collateral, showing that, that this is going to be okay. And when these two guests leave the city, you give me the two strangers back. And there's, there's a parallel here, right? There are two guests, and Lot is offering two, uh, two, of his, two of the valuable people of his household, these two daughters. 
It's not, he's not offering two daughters and his wife because, well, there aren't three guests. There's two guests. So, and so there's this logic here. They are being used as human collateral. Now, that doesn't exactly put Lot in the running for uh, dad of the year, but it's a lot better than knowing that your dad has just offering, offered you up to be raped. And so that is the offer. And they refuse. The crowd won't take this. They will not trust the person that they have appointed to guard their gate. This crowd, this city council, this delegation, they will not trust Lot. They will not see the logic of the situation. They are afraid and they are going to have their way. And that is that. They're afraid and they don't care. They want these two strangers and they want to interrogate them because they want to know if they're spies. And so this is really where we see the sin of Sodom. The sin of Sodom is allowing fear to override everything else and to let that lead to the abuse of power. It's, it's ex- giving in to expediency. Even though one of their own has vouched for them, even though Lot has the situation under control, they are afraid and they are willing to ditch all of their laws, all of their customs, all of the respect they have for each other because they are afraid and they want these two guys out so they can torture them or interrogate them until they know who they are. If you want to know what sodomy is according to the Bible, it has nothing to do with whether your pants are on it has to do with when you follow, whether you follow the, the laws, whether it's convenient or not. And sodomy is disregarding rules and laws when it's inconvenient, when they get in the way. The sin of Sodom is a disregard for the law and a willingness to interrogate and to torture a guest. And so these two guests... They step forward and they, they strike the crowd blind and, and, and they flee with Lot and his family. And the city is destroyed as it has chosen to ignore the law and has become a lawless place where the mob rules. And as si- Sodom has sinned greatly, not just one person, but the very fabric of the social structure of the city is, is being warped here. That's why the whole city is destroyed. The whole fabric of the city has been warped. Over this last month, we have read about how the underwear of a prophet can rot, and we, and we read about uh, the awkward marriage uh, of the prophet Hosea. And by reading that, we learned of the importance of reading in context. Last week, we read about a talking donkey and, and saw and learned how reading something literally is not always the most helpful. Sometimes we have to read it on multiple levels, moral, symbolic, mystical. We read this very weird passage today, and what it teaches us is the importance of reading in context and reading on multiple levels, but even more importantly than that, it teaches us the importance of reading Scripture as part of the grand themes of, of Scripture. When we read something that is weird, like this story of Sodom, and it initially seems like it, 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 it contrast with the grand themes of scripture of God's forgiveness and justice and the way God loves Israel and and the sins of the father are not passed on to the son and we we read of all of these themes of scripture and we read something like Sodom and it seems at odds well we need to go back and read some more that's what this passage shows us it was St. Augustine who pointed out back in the 4th century A.D. that uh, when we read Scripture, we read the whole thing. We study all the main ideas, and we use the clear parts of Scripture to understand the parts that are unclear. But we only do that after we've mastered the main ideas. We had talked earlier this summer about what angers God And what it is that angers God is when an entire community or people or nation goes astray or when leaders are leading a group of people astray. And that's what we're seeing here. We spent some time and we looked at all the different times God is angry and and we can see that the the sin of Sodom is the same type of anger that God has for the other cities, the other nations that go astray. The entire nature, the entire world, fabric of the society is being warped. And so that is why the city is destroyed. 
If you look for the grand themes of Scripture when it comes to the punishment for deranged sexuality, the, the argument there is that this, this, the punishment is in the person's own body. That's how Paul puts it, I believe. And uh, when someone has a deranged sexuality, it doesn't lead to God destroying the city. That, that's not how it works in Scripture. And so we need to read Scripture all together to understand these and make these connections. The sin of Sodom has nothing to do with sex. It has everything to do with the abuse of power and the willingness to give up the law when expedient. Thus far, uh, over this, these weeks, I have chosen passages of Scripture that I had a sense that we could understand if we just looked at them closer and, and worked with them. I don't want us to leave this month looking at weird scriptures and weird passages, thinking that every passage, if you, if you just look at it hard enough, you can figure it out. Because there are some passages that truly are just weird and crazy, and I don't understand. And, and so what we're going to do next week as we wrap up the, the series is we're going to take... I'm going to take the weirdest passages of Scripture that I can find, the passages that I simply can't make any sense of, and I'm going to share those with you. And then I'm going to invite you to ask questions about the passages that you are confused about. We'll have time. with Some people call this a stump the pastor. I think it'll just be some fun. And I'll bring my Bible and a whiteboard, and I invite you to bring your most vexing questions, the things that have always confused you, and we will take a swing at them together. Amen.